Good day and welcome everyone to uh, today's edition of the RAL seminar series. Um, just a, a few housekeeping details. Those of you who are um, who are in the Zoom room, how we'll handle questions at the uh, at the conclusion of the seminar is through the raise hands function. So if you see at the bottom of the Zoom window, a uh, button that says reactions, and then uh, you'll see another button that says raise hand. Uh, we ask that you use that so that we can see uh, we can see that you wish to ask a question. Um, if for some reason that isn't working for you, feel free to uh, message us in the chat that you have a question, and then um, and then we'll call on you. Um, I believe that's all the housekeeping details we have. So welcome to everyone who's uh, both here in the Zoom and watching on the webcast on the Rel website. So now I will hand things over to Jim Brasseur. Jim. Okay, thank you very much. Um, everybody can hear me? Okay, I'm going to assume everybody can hear me. Um, yes, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Brian Argo for today's seminar. Uh, Brian is the chair of the Aerospace Engineering Sciences Department at the University of Colorado, the Shadden Leadership Professor and Chair. The full name is Ann and H.J. Smead, Department of Aerospace Engineering Sciences. Um, Brian is also the director of the Integrated Remote and In-Situ Sensing Program at CU, and he's co-director of the Unmanned Aircraft System and Severe Storms Research Group, USSRG, which is a consortium of public and private sector collaborators um, led by the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and also the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, Brian got his PhD. In fact, he got all three of his degrees at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, his PhD was in aerospace engineering in 1989 as an NSF fellow and a GEM fellow. Um, he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, Aerospace and Space Engineering Board since 2016. Um, and he has received a number of awards. Uh, the, the one that I will mention is 2016, he was elected as fellow of the AIAA, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And with that, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Brian Argo uh, and a very interesting talk today. Um, very interesting, you'll enjoy it. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks uh, Jim for that, for that introduction and um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so this image that you see here um, to, to start this presentation is uh, an image that uh, actually I took this with my cell phone from uh, uh, during our deployment in 2019 um, as part of a project I'll, I'll mention, I'll give more details about here, uh, later. But this is a supercell out in, out in the north east, uh, northwest corner of um, Oklahoma, not quite in the panhandle. And um, so this is the type of weather that uh, in this talk will be tied into, believe it or not, uh, uh, supersonics. So uh, we'll go from supercells to supersonics and talking about the application of aerospace engineering um, to uh, atmospheric and, and, and weather research. And actually, uh, we are going to, let me get over here to uh, actually go in, in reverse order. We'll start off with supersonics. And so I wanna give you a, a bit of a, um, an overview of research that we're doing here at the University of Colorado uh, Boulder, along with colleagues at um, University of Minnesota and uh, Embry-Riddle uh, Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, uh, Florida. And uh, we are teaming on a, a uh, uh, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, university research, uh, par as part of the multidisciplinary use, uh, university research initiative and funded through the Air Force. Um, and uh, we have, we use the acronym high flights to describe the, the, works that we're, the work that we're doing. And so this work uh, in, um, is re uh, related to hypersonics. I, I, I said that the first part of this uh, talk is about supersonics, but of course, hypersonics is uh, is included in in the uh, rubric, if you will, of, of supersonics. And the emphasis of our collaborative uh, research is to characterize the middle stratosphere um, in anticipation of the Air Force. 
uh, designing and deploying uh, hypersonic aircraft. And so our goal is to uh, describe the uh, spatial and temporal uh, behavior of the atmosphere above 20 kilometers. And um, specifically, how the uh, stratosphere reacts in terms of turbulence and particulates to uh, meteorology that's occurring in the troposphere. Um, one of the uh, uh, things that, just, that constrains or that is a focus of what we're looking at is uh, if, you, if you look, for instance, at Mach 7, flying at seven times the speed of sound uh, in the middle stratosphere, um, uh, the spatial extent of disturbances that are potentially important and in terms of maybe becoming amplified in the boundary layer leading to transition from a, tur uh, a, a laminar boundary layer to a turbulent boundary layer, um, we were talking about uh, spatial scales on the order of 20 centimeters to two millimeters in terms of the resolution uh, that we're seeking um, at, at this, this at the altitudes above 20 kilometers. And there's still a lot of uncertainty and much argument as to if these scales, is partic particularly on the lower end, are, are even relevant. Uh, this is, I, I wanna acknowledge the, the team that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, uh, the, the University of Colorado team you see here, um, uh, myself, uh, my colleague Dale Lawrence, we're joined by uh, Aro Barjatya from uh, Embry-Riddle. Uh, our focus is to actually make the in-situ stratospheric measurements for this project. Uh, Graham Candler, well-known in terms of doing hypersonic uh, modeling at the University of, of uh, Minnesota. There's probably several people in the audience that recognize this name, Dave Fritz. Um, and a, as an adjunct, he's working as an adjunct through uh, at Embry-Riddle. And then Andreas Mushinsky uh, and Greg Rieker um, are focused on looking at the uh, at optical propagation and uh, modeling and simulations associated with, uh, with optical propagation. Uh, again, the focus here is in, uh, at altitudes above 20 kilometers. So the challenge that we have is the challenge of the multi scales in which we are trying to make measurements uh, the, uh, and, and, and conduct simulations that will give the Air Force some uh, basis of, in terms of the behavior of, this, of the stratosphere uh, and to be able to forecast that behavior. So what you see here, the, that first launch you saw right there, we, we, we're looking at uh, on scales on the order of um, um, a meter, uh, 10 meters to uh, uh, the scales that I mentioned earlier in terms of the, uh, um, uh, the resolution of, of, of turbulence. Um, here, we, we, this is a, a simulation that uh, done by Dave Fritz and you can't really see, but down here at the very bottom, there's a mountain range there and um, he's looking at zonal flow over the, the mountain range. And the, so this is on a continental scale, basically uh, on the order of 10 to the six, uh, meters uh, and uh, looking at being able to resolve in simulations down to millimeter scale uh, turbulence. So quite the challenge. And uh, this will feed into, as we'll see later, the uh, simulations of the hypersonic uh, flow over a, uh, over a vehicle. And what you see here, that's, uh, this is a simulation that shows uh, the uh, a disturbance, a temperature disturbance upstream of a vehicle that uh, referred to as high flights, the, it's basically a conical shape there. And that's the propagation of the disturbances in the hypersonic flow field. With that thin line that you see right along here is, um, is, the, uh, is the shock wave. So the, there's a closed loop in what we're doing here in that the in situ measurements inform the atmospheric modeling, which then informs the aerothermodynamic aerothermo and optical propagation modeling. And those um, that modeling uh, in a similar fashion feeds back up to uh, drive the requirements for the atmospheric uh, modeling. And then which gives guidance to the types of measurements that we, we need to make in the stratosphere. Uh, so if we look at the, starting with the atmospheric measurements, this slide here shows um, the, uh, I'm gonna turn on the uh, pointer here. So 
this is an instrument developed by my colleague, um, uh, Dale Lawrence here at the University of Colorado Boulder. It's essentially a disposable uh, instrument for uh, measuring turbulence using fine wires. So uh, the way he has this set up, the, the two uh, heads here with the fine, you can't see the wires, but you can see the prongs there. Uh, uh, they go back and forth between being a cold wire uh, to make temperature uh, measurements, um, temperature uh, fluctuations in the hot wire for the velocity fluctuations and circuit board that he has designed. And um, here you see on the right here, some of the turbulence uh, data and you can see versus the altitude here from, in this case, about 18 kilometers to uh, up to about uh, above 35, uh, about 35 kilometers. And one of the major um, uh, developments that we've made in the past uh, couple of years is to reduce the footprint of our, when we started launching these balloons into the stratosphere, we had uh, uh, no fewer than two people and usually at least three people uh, involved in a launch. And one of the things that we've been able to do is reduce that logistics footprint to where uh, one person now can fill it. We have a setup that one person can fill the balloon and uh, also launch the, uh, uh, the, the payload. And we have an auto a set of uh, autonomous stations that we've developed that uh, here in the state of Colorado that allow us to uh, uh, fly these and telemeter the, the data down automatically. The stations will pick up the location of the balloon and, and bring down the, uh, the, the data. And this has been particularly useful when we do intense observation periods uh, associated with the uh, uh, flows over the Rocky Mountains because uh, one of the uh, focuses here is to determine how the, the mountains uh, create gravity waves that then propagate into the stratosphere and, and then break to form turbulence. And so having an automated system where we're launching balloons from the western slope and then to be able to pick them up as they come over the continental divide has, has proven to be uh, quite uh, an addition to our research capability. And so with those turbulence, uh, that turbulence and particulate data, the particulate data uh, development or measurement capability is not as developed uh, as the turbulence at this point. Uh, we can do the turbulence measurements and we're still uh, developing the capability to fly uh, optical particle uh, counters uh, into the stratosphere to, make, to measure particulates. Uh, this is a, uh, a schematic that shows how the uh, the turbulence uh, field here, this is a synthetic turbulence field generated by uh, Dave Fritz and his colleagues um, that uh, incorporates the turbulence intensity that uh, is measured uh, in situ. These, uh, this turbulence then is mapped into a onto a computational grid at the relevant scales um, that um, uh, relative to this, um, this vehicle here is on the order of a meter. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's on the order of somewhere between one and, 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 and 10 meters. Uh, so it's on the order of a meter. And this is a zoom in uh, at the nose here. And so the simulation simu simulates the flight of this vehicle, this, air, uh, this cone through this synthetic turbulence field. And here's an example that you saw uh, that was, when it was running here uh, of the flow uh, of a uh, simulation at Mach 5 uh, demonstrating the capability of taking the turbulence, synthetic turbulence, and mapping that into a direct numerical simulation of the uh, flow around the hypersonic vehicle. Uh, and so uh, one of the, uh, our current projects is associated with, um, uh, the Air Force has a, has built, um, is supporting a test flight of a hypersonic uh, shape uh, a hypersonic geometry uh, from S range in northern uh, rocket range in northern Sweden. And uh, we have been uh, pull, uh, asked to support this effort by uh, providing uh, an intense uh, observation period of balloon launches, pre launch and post launch of the uh, test vehicle. And we'll see, uh, show more about that test vehicle here in just a second. And so this is the, uh, the area here. Um, I think I'm going to turn off this. Uh, well, I'll wait till I get to the next slide. The, the, there's a lag here between the pointer and, um, um, and so I'll turn that off here in just a second to make it a little bit less annoying. So this is a, in, in the area that I'm going to uh, 
that is being simulated here. Uh, again, this is a Dave Fritz uh, simulation where the there's zonal flow over that the the, uh, the peninsula, the uh, Scandinavian peninsula, and this is a slice, a horizontal slice, looking at an altitude of 35 kilometers. And so the purpose of this this simulation is to uh, uh, forecast what we might see in terms of uh, from our balloons um, uh, with the uh, and, and to identify the locations where we might want to try to target if possible uh, balloon launches to, to uh, uh, in order to make these measurements relative to to s range and so this is uh, Dave um, the CG cam that's the uh, complex geometry compressible atmospheric model that uh, his, his group at uh, GATS have, have developed. Uh, and so in order to figure out actually how we might su support the, the, uh, this, this effort, if you look here to the right, this is a schematic taken from, this is the reference here that describes the BOLT experiment. That's a boundary layer transition experiment. And so the, uh, the uh, uh, DLR out of Maraba uh, or and I should say out of Moraba, it's not a, it's not a location. That's the, an acronym for that part of DLR that supports this, uh, the uh, rocket launch. They are uh, actually in charge of uh, conducting the, uh, the launch. So there's a test article that's on, that will be at the top of the, uh, the sounding rocket, this Orion sounding rocket. Um, and you can see here, this describes the trajectory and where our interest is in terms of the, uh, there's a Reynolds number regime on the ascent, as you can see right in this area right here, and the descent uh, that corresponds to about 20, um, 20 kilometers, uh, from uh, about 20 to 35 kilometers. And so it's right in the, pretty much in the sweet spot of where we are making our measurements. And so um, we at first wanted to investigate, could we put balloons actually near that trajectory, you know, uh, uh, when the launch was occurring? Well, it turns out the answer is pretty much no. Uh, because uh, you know we're subject to the uh, prevailing winds, uh, uh, both you know at, at all altitudes uh, on those days. So what we did is to determine if we could, um, how close could we get? And uh, so what we did is uh, this was um, a period, uh, the most recent. Uh, the, the the flight has been delayed uh, the, uh, a couple of times now because of COVID, and so this is one of our more recent uh, calculation or simulation. Uh, set of simulations where we use historic data, GFS uh, data in particular, uh, uh, wind data to put into our model. We, we have a uh, developed a model for uh, the uh, modeling the trajectory of the balloon. And so these are concentric circles around S range. And these are trajectories that basically, and they're 50 mile radius. And these are um, uh, trajectories and you can see that, uh, and what this shows is the launch point is green, apogee is blue, and then the uh, point of uh, the cut down point is the uh, X that you see right there. So uh, the configuration is set up to where uh, we make our measurements on descent. We don't make the turbulence measurements and particulate measurements on the ascent, in part because we're in the wake of the balloon as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, as it's rising, so that would uh, distort the, uh, the turbulence uh, measurements. And plus, these balloons have talc on them, and so we would probably pick up, you know, part particulates coming off the balloon during the descent. So uh, the reason why you see this map here. So this is the area in which we we would uh, actually start to make be making our measurements from the uh, from the the star that you see there, uh, pretty much to the uh, cut cutoff point. So that's where we would make our me measurements. And so what was decided is that since we can't really get as close to, uh, uh, oh, by the way, this is the, the, the triangle you see right there, the red triangle is the launch point and the star there in the center is the uh, uh, descent point. Um, and so this is projected onto the, uh, the map here. So that you, you don't really see the, the apogee is occurring, you know, at almost 300 kilometers, as you can see right here. So this is that trajectory projected here. And so these are, this would show in, from 2016 to, through 2019 uh, in February, these are typical trajectories that would show where our balloons would go. And it would force us actually to launch from Norway uh, to get these balloons within the target area as you see right there. So, um, 
so so this is this is where uh, uh, we will be deploying. The plan is now we the, the launch has been moved to uh, mid June. Uh, depending on the the COVID uh, situation, we're still very uncertain um, if if this can be carried out in June. It was originally supposed to be in uh, May of 2020, and so we're over a year now um, in in delays. And so uh, we'll be looking to conduct this operation um, here soon. Uh, so the Let's talk a little bit about the uh, actual instruments that we've developed um, uh, for making these. Uh, these are fine wire instruments, um, and at the at altitudes above 20 kilometers, one of the challenges is that a typical um, hot wire, for instance, with a five um, micron uh, diameter wire, is very near um, the free molecular flow uh, regime. Uh, so. We are starting, uh, actually that's at the higher altitudes above 30 kilometers is where we would see that. So we, we're in a, a, a Knudsen number range uh, that goes from you know, continuum to almost rare, uh, almost free molecular flow. So uh, there's a big range of, um, of uh, rarefied flow that, we're, that we have to uh, account for. And so this is driving part of our, uh, the uh, development of our instruments. Uh, these instruments have to uh, are developed to uh, uh, for low Reynolds number, high Newton number, stratospheric conditions, and validated models just don't really exist uh, for what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, and so we have built, and I'm going to describe here a a, uh, a high altitude wind wind tunnel uh, or chamber, uh, whatever how you want, want to refer to it, for. Uh, uh, calibrating these instruments um, by producing known flows at, with the, at stratospheric conditions. And we're also using continuum CFD to assist us in, in the uh, more macroscopic uh, uh, visualization of what we're trying to measure. This is the HICAT. So this is the high altitude uh, calibration tunnel. And uh, this uh, is not very glamorous looking, obviously. But basically, if you look at this schematic here, uh, in order to orient you, I've pointed out a couple of uh, 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 where uh, things on the schematic, uh, where they correspond in the actual uh, apparatus. So here you see the rotary vane pump right here, vacuum pump. Here's this styrofoam box right here is the test section um, where um, or it covers this test section that uh, here where we insert the fine wires and insert them into a known, a, a, a pipe flow or a, a poise flow that we can uh, theoretically know the uh, the velocity profile, and so this will allow us then to calibrate these uh, uh, these these wires by using a long entrance length. So the flow is fully developed. So the flow is from left to right. So we have air be, uh, coming through, in which we're controlling the flow rate. We have a jacket of uh, this cooled by liquid nitrogen that enables us to. Uh, control the temperature. So we have full control of the temperature and, and pressure that we can uh, essentially dial in to simulate the, uh, uh, the conditions from um, 20 kilometers to 40 kilometers altitude. This is a schematic here that's very complicated looking. So I want to just focus you on uh, a couple of things here. This shows uh, the, 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 the blue box is sort of the insulation jacket around this inner box here that uh, has the, uh, where we mount the, uh, uh, the fine wire probe. And that probe sticks into the pipe. Uh, you can see a flange right here. And this is the, the smaller uh, diameter pipe is the actual tunnel. The larger diameter pipe is the jacket that carries the, uh, the, uh, the uh, liquid nitrogen or the, it's actually gaseous nitrogen when it's uh, in, the, in the jacket here. So what we're doing is this is a cut through the test section. And so this is where the probe is. And then the wire is actually in this location right here. This may be hard to see, but this is a, uh, a cartoon of the parabolic profile that we know from theory is produced uh, uh, in this flow. And so we are sampling a known profile and we can um, simulate fluctuations by translating the probe to uh, Correspond to different parts of the, uh, the different speeds associated with that profile. 
Uh, this is uh, some of our original um, uh, computations to verify what we, uh, these measurements. Um, what you see right here, this is a typical uh, Dantec probe geometry uh, that you see right here with the two prongs and the wire across there. And this is a simulation using um, a commercial CFD package called Star CCM Plus. Uh, that's uh, the uh, uh, a primary. It's a multi-field uh, 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 simulation tool develop, uh, that's now owned by Siemens. Uh, it, it used to be uh, at, at one time was it was uh, um, uh, is a different company, but Siemens is now the the company that owns that that that. Uh, that software. And what we're simulating here is this is the uh, the wire that across here. So the prongs here that you see the lines that, that say prongs, uh, that's associated with the, uh, the physical prongs here with the wire. And we are simulating the actual profile uh, that accounts for the fact that the, pro the prongs actually uh, produce a, uh, a wake and it creates a profile um, along the wire that we're actually simulating that we, uh, uh, are actually trying to make our measurement. Here is a, an actual um, set of, um, uh, this is the theoretical profile that you see here, the pro parabolic profile. And then the simulation profile is offset a bit uh, from the, uh, the theory because when we insert the probe into the test section, there's a bit of blockage uh, that comes, uh, the sense that the flow uh, experiences and so, the more we, uh, the further we insert, uh, so this would be the bottom of the, uh, the, the tunnel, if you will, um, across the diameter to the top. And as we extend uh, the probe into the, uh, into the flow, of course it causes blockage and distorts it a bit. And so that's, that manifests in sort of an offset that you see right there in, in terms of uh, the actual profile that we measure. Uh, and this is just another uh, a different type of probe right here and a similar uh, simulation in which we are simulating the flow uh, that the wire will, will experience. Um, and then this slide here actually, uh, there's actually a wire across here that's uh, pretty hard to see, but, uh, and you probably can't see it, but these are the tips of the prongs of our own um, uh, in-house made uh, fine wires. And, um, and here we actually are simulating the flow across the wire itself. And so this requires us to use a, uh, we, we use a, a direct simulation Monte Carlo code to um, uh, simulate the, uh, uh, in the Newton number ranges that you see right here, um, uh, actually here, um, where the range is from a continuum up to almost a, a Newton number of about four which is well into the uh, rarefied regime and approaching uh, free molecular flow. This is just us comparing our simulations, uh, DSMC simulations to uh, data from uh, uh, in the literature from Xi et al, uh, as you see right here. And you can see that we're, we're in, in the, we're, there's fairly good agreement. We're still working on the uh, numerical aspects of this that, uh, that, uh, will enable us to get, uh, we expect to get a closer agreement uh, between our simulations and, and the uh, published uh, uh, correlations. The, the reason why we need this is because uh, we need to be able to develop a uh, heat transfer uh, coefficients that allow us to convert the fluctuations that we, that we measure in terms of velocity and temperature um, to convert those into, well, the measurements actu into actual velocity and temperature fluctuations. And so, we enable. Uh, we we have to have the heat transfer correlations uh, that uh, describe the behavior of the of the uh, heated wire and the uh, cold wire in order for us to uh, make those uh, uh, those calculations. And finally, the uh, this is uh, one of the questions: is um, what happens as the, as the uh, probe? And this is this shows the gondola box, and then you see the pro the turbulence probes are right there on the on the very tip. Um, so as this box is descending, um, the, uh, it's, it's incompressible flow. So it creates a disturbance that propagates out ahead of the box. And so one of the questions is how much does the, the box uh, and, and even the balloon that's, that's uh, about 10 meters above it, how much does it affect the approaching turbulence 
uh, in terms of what we're trying to measure. And so there are a few papers that describe uh, the, uh, the, how the, uh, this, this obstacle actually affects the strain rates and, and it does have a direct impact on the turbulence measurement. In this particular case, we were modeling uh, with a shield around the, uh, uh, the temperature, pro uh, the, the fine wires, uh, we were considering to uh, reduce the uh, effects of radiation from sunlight on the measurements. And uh, we wanted to investigate how much that would affect the, uh, uh, the incoming turbulence uh, uh, in, in the measurement. So what we did is, is uh, in the inflow condition, uh, prescribed a, uh, a oscillations at some frequency and looked at what the attenuation would be between the entrance uh, and the uh, at the probe uh, tip, and we were looking at um, and 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 the things that we measured are in agreement with uh, with the literature in terms of of the attenuation. We're we're currently doing actual DNS models uh, modeling of the directly of the turbulence and the impact of the uh, uh, the probe itself on the approaching turbulence. So um, this is just a summary of the things that we, we just talked about. So the next steps really are for us to uh, complete the, um, uh, the calibration procedures that we've, we've developed and to, um, uh, we've, we actually, actually have a, a substantial uh, a database now of, um, of measurements. And so uh, generally you would like to do the, have the calibration set up in advance of the, uh, of making the measurements, but uh, because of the nature of this product, uh, of this uh, project, and the fact that this is the first of its kind that we're sort of thing we're doing, we actually are making the measurements, and then the calibration is uh, is is an ongoing uh, part of that project. All right, so take a breather here, here real quick, uh, and you might be wondering, so what the heck does connects? How can he connect supercells and supersonics? And you know this sort of goes back to my beginning of my career as a uh, where I was told you know as a young faculty member that you really have to focus your research. You cannot be you know if you're going to get tenure, you got to be really deep in you know some particular area. And I've chosen to be deep in multiple areas, and and so and so far it's worked. And so uh, the tenure decision is passed. So I kind of feel like I have. Uh, uh, you know, whatever I'm interested in is, you know, is what I what I will do. But I think it'll become clear toward the end of this part of the talk what the uh, connection is between the supercells and supersonics. So, part two is really going to focus on some of the unmanned aircraft systems work that we've been doing, um, and particular focused on supercells. So this is from 2010. Uh, this is the uh, uh, vortex two experiment of uh, verification of the origins of rotation in tornadoes experiment the second one because the first one happened in the, the mid 90s this is a tornado on the ground near deer trail colorado or last chance actually is where it's really close to and we are part of the vortex two project sort of as a proof of concept um, uh, experiment that nsf was willing to fund us with some a uh, small uh, part of the project to demonstrate that we could work with, first of all, work with the FAA to get permission to make these flights towards the uh, supercell, and then to be able to develop the technology that would carry, in this instance, a pressure temperature humidity probe uh, or uh, SOND, actually a Visala uh, RS-92, uh, to carry that in the uh, vicinity of the, uh, well, beneath the uh, the supercell. And you can see right here, the tornadoes had stopped forming, but the wall cloud is still there. Still there. And one of the things I want to point out here is that uh, we, we really wanted to launch much earlier, but at that time, the FAA required us to give a two hour notice before we got into the air. Uh, and so uh, that was part of the, the regulatory challenge was far greater than the tech, uh, technology challenge. And by the way, this, this grainy video, uh, we didn't originally have video for this, um, on our aircraft and the meteorologist kept telling us, you know, you know, guys, we want, we got to get some video. So we literally, literally sent us uh, one of our graduate students down to a, a Walgreens and they bought one of those little USB cameras that, uh, and we taped it onto the, to the, uh, onto the wing of this, of our Tempest aircraft that you see right there flying. Um, 
and that's looking up through the uh, sunroof of a SUV taking that photo. So um, that flight, which is the first that we're aware of on, on a tornadic, a tornadic uh, supercell um, uh, by a drone, uh, it, uh, the trajectory is shown here. This is uh, radar data from one of the uh, mobile Doppler radars that was part of the deployment. And the barbs here uh, are the wind measurements that we were making and the temperature, uh, the number you see there is the altitude in meters. So we're about a thousand feet. That was limited that the, at that time the FAA would let us fly in terms of altitude. And then this is the trajectory uh, of the flight. So those data um, led to uh, a verification of this pulsing um, that you see here uh, associated with this particular storm. Uh, you can see there's a very sharp boundary. Um, the, uh, the air mass boundaries is uh, uh, locating them and and um, uh, and measuring the jumps across those boundaries as part of the this work. You can see right here a pretty sharp uh, boundary there in terms of this uh, virtual potential temperature. And um, so this is part of the data, very simple data that we we collected uh, in 2010. And this is just to show the uh, uh, this is from the uh, uh, original, uh, one of the presentations I gave years ago showing uh, the, uh, the crew for the, or the team, the Vortex 2 team, which was over a hundred people, hundred scientists and in, uh, students. I think we were the only engineers, uh, those of us from the University of Colorado. And this is just some of the equipment showing the, the mobile radar, uh, the distrometers you see right there, uh, the NS uh, National Severe Storms Lab, uh, mesonets, me mobile mesonets, and so forth. And the point of this is that even at that time, one reason why we uh, uh, NSF decided to fund us is because uh, the Vortex 2 uh, organizing committee said that in situ measurements uh, with, with uh, unmanned aircraft systems would be critical to uh, understanding, uh, helping to understand tornado formation. This is the area in which uh, the, uh, uh, the, the entire Vortex 2 uh, roamed all over the Great Plains, as you see, see right here. And this is the area in which the, the FAA gave us our initial permission to fly uh, our UAS. Uh, so the legacy of that 2010 was this is the Tempest. Uh, well, this is a uh, twister. So it's the second generation of the aircraft that you saw that was launched in the earlier video, which had a single motor uh, mounted in the nose. One of the things we, want, we needed to do is uh, we wanted to make wind measurements. So in order to make wind measurements, uh, we needed to free up the nose so that we could extend a, a multi-hole probe from the nose into the uh, pristine air that's coming over the, the aircraft. And so the, the, the double um, motor twister was born. And what you just saw there was the, in the two videos here was a, the launch sequence. We launched the twister from the roof of uh, one of our, what we call our tracker vehicles. Once it was in the air, then we would drive towards the storm and the, the, the twister, the UAS would, uh, would actually follow, use what we call follow me. And it would actually follow the, um, uh, the location of, the, of the, uh, the SUV or the tracker vehicle. And we had the uh, ability to, to command it to points relative to this um, SUV. So we could have it out ahead of us, behind us, to the left, to the right. And, um, but the FAA requirement was that we knew where it was and we could see it at all times. And what I wanted to show right here is that all these people right here were you know, really kind of involved with launching this one aircraft. And so that just doesn't work when you're in an environment right here where you know, if a tornado is coming towards you, you don't want a bunch of people uh, having to uh, get out of the way. So leading up to today or 2019, uh, the new project um, is Taurus. Um, so it's a follow on. So almost 10 years after the original uh, Vortex 2, we have assembled, this is the team here now. And now you notice that uh, part of this team are is three, uh, of our new aircraft called the uh, Raven, which you will see here in a second. And in addition to the Raven, which is a 15 pound, um, six foot wingspan um, uh, UAS, you have the, we're flying actually with a hurricane hunter, uh, a NOAA P3. We're flying in uh, uh, coordinating 
with the P3 to fly our drone at the same time in the same airspace. Uh, and again, that we think that's probably the first time that's ever happened. So this is the, um, and also we're flying uh, up to three of these aircraft at the same time, which is something else that was new, that's new with Taurus is we've worked out with the FAA to fly multiple drones to make simultaneous measurements in the storm. So these are the research objectives of, of, of Taurus. And basically it comes down to, again, looking at um, air mass boundaries, coherent structures, um, and to re relate the, um, the behavior of the, uh, or the evolution of the storm relative to the ambient conditions. Um, and these are some of the, uh, some data that were motive, uh, that, that was cited in the proposal. Uh, and much of this was a result of the original Vortex 2. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, these data that you see right here are actually the same data from that uh, earlier slide that I showed that um, where this is the published uh, uh, diagram. So the concept of operations for Taurus uh, is this is a reflectivity cartoon, if you will, of a supercell. And so this is uh, the hook echo that you see right here. So the storm would generally be moving to the uh, either due east or more often to the north northeast or the east northeast, I should say. Um, here is the 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 P3 would be orbiting the storm as you see right here, um, and the we have three drone teams or three UA, UAS teams. Uh, one is targeting the, the what's called the right flank of the of the. Uh, of the supercell. So this, this is an area in which we were familiar from Vortex 2 because that's what we targeted. Uh, and it's a relatively safe area because if a tornado forms here, it's generally going to be moving away from uh, the team here. But now we have a left flank team. And so the left flank team um, is really getting into the thick of things, flying one, um, one of our uh, Ravens. Um, along with the, this, this team with these ground vehicles that you see right here. And then we had a near inflow team that was flying profiles out in front of the storm, a few tens of kilometers uh, out ahead of the storm. Um, and we officially coordinated with the P3 so that they would know where we were, where we, you know, the altitudes we were flying, so that we can maintain a minimum of 2,500 feet uh, separation. So that all went well uh, in 2019. And this is the region in which we we roamed and, uh, well, we had permission to roam. And actually, as you'll see a bit later, it was a strange year and we never really got past the Southern part of Nebraska. This is the Raven. And um, this is the, again, uh, the, uh, uh, a typical uh, radar uh, image of a, of a supercell. And you can see right here, this, this is where the three aircraft were targeted. This is a, a, schema, a blow up, a photograph of a Raven with uh, showing the various uh, things that uh, it flies with. This is uh, now a bit dated. We have a lot of additional instruments that we carry on this aircraft now. And by the way, we can get um, on the order of three, uh, generally uh, somewhat greater than two and a half hours of flight time of this three, aircraft. Two, and this is how one. we launch, as you see right here um, from, so we went from where we had to get out of our van to set up a, uh, uh, you know, a ground bungee launcher to now we pull over to the side of the road, we pull out the airplane, assemble it in, in five minutes, we're in the air. And believe me, that, that, that is critical. If you're going to be uh, intercepting the left flank, you need to be able to move very fast um, because um, there's a good chance that uh, you might see a tornado bearing down on you, which you'll see here in just a second. So this is just a montage uh, from uh, our 2019 deployment. We intercepted uh, 18 uh, storms total. 15 of those were super, by the way, this is a tornado, if you can see right there, that's a tornado on the ground near Tipton, Kansas. Um, uh, this was our very first day out and we had to stop to let the this tornado cross the road. Um, and so while we're stopped here, pull over, pulled over, the airplane is above us at about 2,000 feet, just uh, orbiting. And unfortunately, the video wasn't working. Uh, this was the first day, and you know, of all times for us to to be this close to a tornado, and we couldn't get the video from it because of, because of that. And then there's just some more video showing some of the conditions that the, these ravens uh, take a lick in, and they keep on ticking. Uh, the The aircraft itself is made of very high um, strength foam, 
It's a type of foam that's used in car bumpers, actually. And uh, so very tough. We've flown through three quarter inch hail, downpours, and these airplanes just fly through it all. So these are the places where we roam. This is Colorado here, Oklahoma here in 2019. Usually by June, as you see right here, we're in the Oklahoma, Texas panhandle. In normal years, we would be in South Dakota or North Dakota, but for some reason, um, all the, most of the supercells were uh, stayed in the uh, south of Nebraska. This was our very first day, and this is the area where we intercepted the storm, the, the tornadic storm that you saw earlier near McCook, Nebraska. Uh, and then I'll just show, I'll wrap this up by showing you some of the data that we collected. This is the real time speed. The other video you saw was sped up uh, four times, but this is a real time video. This storm had uh, it was probably formed about five minutes earlier off, off to the left here out on the field. And um, we, again, like I said, we got as close as we wanted to get and you'll see cars zipping by. That's the, uh, the tornado chasers, if you will, that uh, do, this, do, do this for fun. And they, they want to get as close as possible. So, uh, so here's the, if you look here at the left flank, um, this is the trajectory we flew uh, there uh, relative to the reflectivity that you see here from the radar. And these are data that we collected. Uh, this is the reflectivity that gives you an idea of where the precipitation was. This is the wind in terms of the horizontal uh, north and east components than the temperature that you see right here. The right flank uh, trajectory was a bit, uh, wasn't as, as, as long uh, in terms of the flight. And so, but these are some of the data that they uh, collected there. Um, and I wanted to show this. Uh, this was one of the most interesting days we had in the field, and this was near go ahead, Goodland, launch. Kansas. This is uh, the start of the, our first launch during the day. And uh, when we're launching, there were um, uh, storms, several storms were, were starting to form. And by the time we were landing, um, there were so many tornadoes around that you, here are the students. This is a tornado that's several miles away and the students aren't even paying any attention to it. You know, there's, we'd seen so many that day. And in fact, there's a little bit of a dust cloud there. There were two tornadoes on the ground at the same time from that storm uh, while we were flying on this, our storm. And this third one, I'm gonna start here, it's not very long, but this is to show you the kind of conditions that sometimes we saw. And so this is a multiple vortex tornado that's starting to form in a field as we're driving, uh, driving away from it. And you'll see some rotation in the clouds up here as well as on the ground. And so uh, we didn't even know this was behind us until our scout vehicle told us that we might want to speed up because there was a tornado forming uh, off our right uh, flank uh, and, and a bit behind us. So um, that was a very interesting day. And then near the end of the day, this is what we saw. This is that same supercell, but it's very mature here. It looks like a giant flying saucer. And this is a, uh, a tornado that has formed that is uh, rotating uh, anti-cyclonic. Uh, and so we we didn't even know it was on the ground until somebody happened to look in the rear view mirror and saw it. And we, so we pulled over to get some video. So a very active day of tornadoes on that day. Uh, and then once again, I wanted to show you this. This is a, the wedge tornado as we were approaching it near Beloit, Kansas or Tipton, Kansas. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is because this is almost exactly the way we drew it up with the left flank uh, intercept that you see right here uh, that uh, saw earlier. Here's the hook echo, the storm is moving in this direction and we're getting in and getting out, getting these measurements that you see here before the tornado gets too close. And this, uh, now you can see it right there. And the last part of this, is where the connection comes to the hypersonics. So we're leaving this storm and looking back at sunset and there are multiple supercells here, but you notice these undulations that you see here in the anvil. Those are, uh, these supercells sometimes can punch up to 75,000 feet, so well into the stratosphere. And these pulses that are sent out create gravity waves. And this, this is showing you the, you can see the gravity waves in the cloud uh, itself. And so we actually had from the original, uh, the balloon team that uh, I described earlier, we had a team that was out uh, launching balloons into the stratosphere from our other project, uh, measure, uh, looking to measure uh, the effects of the gravity waves that are being generated by these supercells at the same time that we were, the, our NSF team was underneath these storms uh, sampling the, uh, uh, fr from beneath. 
And so that's where the connection is from supercells to supersonics is that um, there's a connection there and the Air Force is very interested in knowing uh, all the sources of turbulence in, in the, in the uh, stratosphere and supercells are one of those sources. And uh, since they are, you know, relatively sporadic, you know, you can't uh, forecast exactly where they're going to be uh, on a given day. This is part of the uh, understanding the ability to uh, to locate and describe the sources of turbulence in the stratosphere. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the uh, team members. This this is for the uh, the uh, Taurus team. Our overall PI is Adam Houston at University of Nebraska, and we're collaborating with Texas Tech um, and the uh, National Severe Storms Lab at uh, um, in, in Oklahoma. So with that, there's a, there's a lot of talking there, and so I'm happy to answer, uh, to answer any questions. Very good. Thank you very much, Brian. So if people would please uh, use the raise uh, hand feature to um, ask questions or you can put it in the chat. Um, I'm looking for raised hands. Oh, there's a raised hand, Sue. Sue? You there, Sue? Unmute, can't unmute. <laughs> <laughs> you can't unmute? No, you're, she, she just spoke, so she's un uh, yeah. unmuted. Oh, okay. They weren't allowing me to unmute at first. Okay, okay, got it now. So, Brian, thanks so much for this really great two-pronged seminar. I guess what I'd like to know, and, you know, you're talking to NCAR, which is a modeling group, of course. How has what you've learned through having all these um, UAV deployments around supercells, how is that... Uh, impacting both our understanding and our ability to better model these supercells and, and tornado formation. Uh, thank you, Sue. Uh, one of the uh, motivators uh, for the funding that we have received, we received early on, uh, was to um, uh, was to eventually to evaluate not us but the uh, modelers evaluate the Im impact of either assimilating the data that we are collecting into the, uh, into the models and, and looking to see, uh, you know, if there's an increase in skill in terms of uh, by, from that, and also to have a better understanding of what is actually fit, uh, going on inside of the storm by making in situ measurements. There's, there's only so much that a, a remote sensing from a, a Doppler radar uh, will, will tell you, and the thermodynamic conditions are essentially inferred. And so we're getting in there and actually making the measurements in, in situ. Uh, and so there are questions about the, uh, the rear flank downdraft, for instance, in terms of the, uh, the buoyancy and negative buoyancy and so forth, you know, the conditions of that uh, downdraft and how that seems, certain conditions seem to uh, uh, precede the formation of, of large tornadoes. And so, um, and it's a downdraft, so you can't get balloons in it. Uh, and so, uh, but you can fly, a, 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 you know, a small UAS into that area, uh, in, into the downdraft and make those measurements. Uh, one of our more recent developments is we've developed uh, pseudo Lagrangian drifters. Um, and so this is where we have a Mylar balloon carrying a microson that we've developed in house. And uh, we have demonstrated that we can launch those from our, from our, our UAS. Uh, and so we've developed a capability, uh, a preliminary capability. We've, we've only had a really one successful launch. Uh, we haven't had that opportunity to try that many times, but, but we have been able to show that we can launch the, a Lagrangian drifter, a pseudo Lagrangian drifter from our, our balloon, I mean, from our aircraft. And the idea is that it gets entrained into the storm and we have additional measurements where we can't actually fly. Uh, but we can get balloons in there, including the, the rear flank downdraft because now we're launching uh, these balloons downstream of the of the aircraft. I mean, of the storm and above the outflow. So um, the balloon actually will uh, will get in, be become entrained and um, actually be forced uh, carried into the downdraft so we can get those measurements. Hmm. So to answer your question, it's two things. One is to 
uh, provide uh, in situ data to better understand the dynamics of, uh, or the thermodynamics and the wind of what's occurring in the storm. And then also to potentially be a, a, a data provider for forecasting where we uh, have, you know, like we already demonstrated we can fly teams. And so if you can get simultaneous measurements in these storms and, and that data can be assimilated into uh, models, that's a whole new tool now uh, to uh, in, improve uh, the modeling and forecasting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any hands up. I don't believe, if, if you've got your hand raised, go ahead and unmute your mic. But in the absence of hands, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask. Um, so Brian, um, if you go back to slide eight, uh, if you wouldn't mind, um, there, I think you're showing gravity waves uh, I think you said it was a simulation, a Dave Fritz simulation of gravity waves. Um, okay, let me uh, go back to slide. You said slide eight? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And can you... Hmm. Ben, you you'll need to reshare your presentation. Oh, so, oh, sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't intend to do that. <laughs> so let me... Uh, Go back to, here we go. Sorry about that. And uh, reshare, where's the, oh, there it is. Share screen. Everything was going so smoothly I, until now. So, slide eight. Yep, I'm trying to navigate to that. I may have to just. just come out of the, uh, yeah, the presentation there. and you can choose it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that wasn't it. It was it was a simulation. I'm pretty sure that Dave Fritz did of yep. gravity waves. Yep. And uh, there's got to be a faster way to get there, but I'm not. It's not working. So I'm going to literally do this slow poke uh, approach. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean to take this time. So no, go ahead and ask the question while I'm while well, I'm going. What I well, my question is about the relative scale between the turbulence. Uh, so you were thinking about hypersonic vehicles. Uh, typically, I'm not sure what what the what the height of the, there. I think you just passed it. No, not that one. Um, not this one. This I is slide eight. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. go to the next one then. So you want to see the simulation? This has a simulation in it. No, no, no. So. Go, go to the next one. Or, All right. There, that one. That's the one. No, that's that, the, okay. That is it. Okay, go ahead. Are those gravity waves? Uh, not necessarily. Those are those are large scale. Uh, they're coherent structures but not necessarily gravity waves. Uh, actually, what Dave has shown here recently is he's, 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 he's di quote, discovered uh, in simulation uh, some Kelvin, Kel uh, new type of Kelvin-Helmholtz instability in which you have these rolls that, that connect and create knots that break to form turbulence. And so um, uh, th that's some, somewhat um, related, but, but this is, uh, I, I can't say that these are actual gravity waves, but these are certainly, uh, gravity okay. wave-like features. Well, what, what my question is really about the kind of turbulence that a hypersonic vehicle is experiencing in the stratosphere. Yes. So, and and the and the relative scale between the turbulence uh, eddies uh, and the uh, actual vehicle itself, and right. the layer on the vehicle itself. So, can you tell me a little bit about is it is it is it gravity wave generated turbulence exclusively? that is of interest here? Or are there other kinds of turbulence? So what are the relative scales between the turbulence eddies and the vehicle? Okay, okay. so uh, the one of the uh, things that's emphasized in the research we're doing is to determine what are the sources. So uh, supercells, for instance, or deep convection is a, is a source in which gravity waves are created and then they break. And when it's the breaking and then the cascade down to the smaller scales, till you get down to scales that are relevant uh, for the, uh, you know, for uh, that might create disturbances that would lead to boundary layer separation. And if you re recall the very first slide I, I showed, I, I talked about from 20 centimeters to two, two millimeters as being the scales of, of you know, in terms of the, the eddies or, you know, the turbulence in which it would um, potentially impact, um, well, create disturbances at the frequencies that could be amplified. So, so the, the largest scale is continental scale, you know, at the, in the inertial uh, scales, 
down to uh, you know Kolmogorov scale, which would start you know on the order of the on the millimeter side uh, that we were talking about. So, yeah. uh, so, so again, my my question really is about the, the turbulence that is actually impacting the function of the hypersonic vehicle. So continental scale is not relevant. No, it's uh, it's the twenty twenty scale is generally has too little energy to be relevant. Right. So generally, you're looking at the inertial range or integral scales, and I'm just trying to get some sense. Let's let's stick with integral scales for gravity waves that have broken into turbulence. What kind of size are these eddies? I, I just wanted to get some idea. How, how big are they relative to the vehicle? Well, what's what's important to the vehicle is on the order of 20 centimeters to two millimeters. Again, that's the scale in which as the aircraft is flying, you know, at Mach 7, that is the scale of a disturbance that would, that would uh, potentially generate um, uh, generated uh, the disturbance at a frequency, which is on the order of um, the uh, uh, kilohertz uh, from on the order of 100 kilohertz to up to um, uh, uh, 600 or so uh, kilohertz. Um, those are the frequencies. Uh, well, actually, there are two primary uh, frequencies in, those, in that range in which the, they've shown, they meaning the uh, simulations and also some experiments, that uh, those are frequencies that get could get amplified and uh, leading to uh, boundary layer uh, separation or yeah. boundary layer transition. Yeah. So, 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 so that's, at the, that's, the, that's at the end of the cascade uh, right. that starts at the continental scale that gets the, the relevant scales for the vehicle. These vehicles, you know, on the order of a meter, um, uh, a, f a few meters in size. And so the disturbances that are relevant to the boundary layer um, and which is what we're focused on is, uh, is the boundary layer. Those in, are in the range of 20 centimeters to two millimeters. Right. And so what would be the integral scale roughly? Uh, you know, integral scale for eddies that are created by breaking gravity waves at the stratosphere at the location of the hypersonic vehicle. Uh, I would, I, I'm going to say that I can't answer that. Um, yeah, I, I, I would feel uncomfortable answering that. That would be one I would I would uh, direct to Dave Fritz uh, okay. to give that answer. And um, okay. um, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got another question? Yeah, other questions. I don't see any more hands up. Um, all right. Um, I, I have other questions, but I don't. <laughs> I yeah. want to be the only one asking questions. Um, all right. Well, maybe, maybe uh, if, if nobody else has a question, maybe this is a, a, a time to draw the seminar to a close and thank Brian very much for a really interesting discussion. Really interesting. Yes, I'd, I'd like to add my thanks to Brian for just a, a fantastic seminar with um, you know, just great engaging visuals and animations. I think that sets a standard for all of us uh, giving seminars as well. So um, thank you for giving a seminar for us uh, here at RAL.